Federal and state officials have been here on the scene all day examining debris, and they're here now as well. I want to give you a live look of the scene here behind me. The heavy construction equipment just arrived about 30 minutes ago. They're using that to help pull pieces of the plane as well as remains of the victims out of a huge hole in the ground in this field. All of this while investigators are still trying to figure out what caused the plane to crash. Police investigators take pictures from the sky from a helicopter hovering above the wreckage. That will help the guys uh, take a better look at it to, to try to put pieces back together. Federal investigators also on the scene. The largest uh, amount of uh, material, if you will, is in the ground. Uh, so we believe that the, uh, the way the aircraft descended into the ground and probably the speed at the time of the collision uh, caused it to go into the ground. So uh, we're, uh, we just have to take our steps to properly uh, go backwards and bring that back out. The crash happened around 6 o'clock last night, right across the street from Ramona Rubel's house. I never heard of noise any louder than what I heard in my whole life. It would sound like a bomb. Witnesses told police they saw the plane on fire before it hit the ground. FAA records say it was a Cirrus SR-22, similar to this plane, a single-engine fixed-wing plane. Three people on board. All three were killed. We really hate for them, but I truthfully think it was so quick. I don't, I don't think they felt anything. The plane was registered to Orthopedic Aviation Services in Delaware, but our attempts to contact the company were unsuccessful. Flight records say it was heading from Iowa to Findlay, Ohio. It started losing altitude quickly and lost contact with air traffic controllers at around 5,000 feet. It's still not clear if there were any radio distress calls. Debris field is rather large. Uh, the pieces are rather small. And so uh, to put that stuff back together, I can only imagine it's going to take time, hours, possibly days. The sheriff tells me that investigators expect to be out here the rest of the night and again tomorrow, still investigating this crash. As for the victims on board, we are still trying to find out who they were, where they were going, and why they were on that plane. Live in Paulding County, Ohio, Ellis Ivinson, News Channel 15. Cameras recorded the suspect in Monday's homicide at the Smokehouse Tobacco Outlet, and police are asking for your help in helping recognize him. While the images you've seen are a little grainy, News Channel 15's Alyssa Ivinson and discovered today that they're actually good compared to what police usually get. Alyssa? That's right. We sat down with one of Fort Wayne's forensic examiners today, and these pictures are actually blown up and cropped. That's why they aren't crystal clear. And this came from what police say is a good camera. Many businesses, though, still have out-of-date technology, which makes finding the suspect on camera more difficult. This is with the filters on. That's what I had to start with. Fort Wayne police use state-of-the-art technology to clarify surveillance pictures and video. You can actually see some of the definition of his face, whereas this, you can hardly tell that's a face. Last fall, the department also got a better way to copy images in a business. Plug into their system with the USB and then capture the video. But they're only as good as the images they get. If you have a video system that's 15 to 20 years old, how good is the quality? Forensic examiner Detective John Helmsing says about 60% of the surveillance shots the department gets are poor quality. Forensics can clarify pixels and brighten the image, but they urge business owners to update old technology with more modern digital cameras. Quality. Yeah, it's all about quality. Police say a business can get a pretty good camera system for less than $1,000, but they say the important key is to have it purchased and installed before anything happens. Make sure that you're, you're, you're setting it to the highest capture rates because that's really what's important for forensic uh, clarification of images. Main Street Bistro and Martini Lounge in downtown Fort Wayne has a state-of-the-art system, saying it's an investment that's just a smart business decision. It is important to be current with the technology so that you've got clear pictures if anything should happen. Police say to think about it like cell phones and how far this technology has come. It's the same idea with security cameras. In Studio 15, Alyssa Ivinson, News Channel 15. Support for Nate extends beyond the fire department. Nate's strong images are all over Facebook. His cancer treatments have kept him from being able to work at the station, but today, lunch was back in the engine house. Mills is a husband, father, papa. Fire trucks, I know, it's awesome, isn't it? That's what you ride. That's what I ride, exactly. And a brother. That's where my heart's at. Sitting on the back of a fire truck, Nate's home again. It's very humbling that the department thinks enough of me to do something like this for me. Nate's very well loved. 
He's a hero. He's also battling cancer. Nate had melanoma removed from his back in 2000. And they thought they got it all, and 12 years later, boom, you know, it's all, it, it was throughout the whole body. Nate went to the cancer treatment center, but more than a year later, doctors say there's nothing else they can do. I've gotten this diagnosis now three to four months. Well, that's doctor's time. That's not God's time. That's not my time. Nate is a firefighter's firefighter. Nate started as a volunteer in Markle in 1993 and joined Fort Wayne's department in 2006. He loved coming to work. He always had a smile on his face and was so fun to be around because he was just in such a happy mood. I was talking about his brothers and all his, all his family up here. When his cancer came back, he wasn't alone. His firefighter family answered the call. Providing things like wood pellets for his house, and uh, some guys went out and built a ramp for his house. They've brought tools out, they've helped fix things, they, um, they've come out and prayed with us, come out and just picked him up, got him out of the house and took him to dinner. They mean the world to him, and he came in the world to them. This is what we do with the guys. Nobody, he's not asked for a thing. Through it all, Nate isn't giving up, spreading the power of positivity. He lifts you up and he brings you up. Um, I, I don't know how he does it. For me, it's easy. Um, if, it, if it really is the end, you know, if, I'm, if I don't beat this, I've, I've had a great life. I've got a beautiful wife that I love with all my heart. I've helped raise two great kids, um, and I've had the best job in the world. You know, what's there not to be positive about? I firmly believe miracles happen every day. I'm not giving up. I still, in my mind, I'll be on the back of a rig again. Until then. Hey, buddy boo. He'll cherish every moment. Oh, come and see you, Bethel. Alyssa Ivinson, mm. News Channel 15. I love you. Thank you. To the moon and the stars. Hi. Mm. News Channel 15's Alyssa Ivinson sat down with Lundy in prison where he shared never before heard details about the day he went from kid to killer. From the day of the homicide in Cromwell in 2010, through the legal process, and now to prison, I've covered Colt Lundy's story for years. For several hours, Lundy showed us what his life is like in prison. He opened up about his crime and how he's trying to turn his life around. It looks like a quiet neighborhood off of Lake Wawa Sea. Police found 49-year-old Philip Danner dead in his home Wednesday morning. You see him where accidental shootings happened at that age, but nothing at, at this uh, magnitude. My heart goes out to them. However, the crime uh, has been charged as such. Face those murder charges in adult court. Pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit murder. 30 years behind bars. The last five of that sentence will be served as probation. It never even occurred to me that I could be sent to prison. Do you remember firing the shots? Yeah. Behind the heavy metal doors of the Wabash Valley Correctional Facility, in a cell not much larger than a closet, is 19-year-old Colt Lundy. Most of my stuff is in these two boxes right here. He's been incarcerated for four years. He lives with the adult population now, but started on the juvenile side. He came to prison when he was 15. It was pretty scary. I just stayed out of the way and didn't really talk to a whole lot of people. April 20th, 2010, Lundy went from kid to killer when he and another boy, 12-year-old Paul Gingrich, shot his stepfather. It's just with me all the time. And even when I get out, you know, it's going to be with me. Lundy That's says good. he had a pretty normal childhood growing up in Kosciuszko County. My mom and dad, you know, being split the whole time. Um, that was always a factor. Philip Danner came into his life when he was five or six and eventually became his stepdad. I didn't understand, you know, the permanency of him in my life at that point. When I was younger, you know, it was, it was um, good, I, I'd say. And then as I just got older, um, you know, it just got, uh, got worse. Lundy says Danner would drink and get violent. He confronted his mom about it. And I said, you know, either he, he leaves or I leave. Lundy dreamed of going to California, even ran away from home once. But he doesn't remember how it was decided that he needed to kill Danner. We were discussing our plans to 
you know, to leave. Like I tell everybody else, I mean, I can't remember who brought it up. And I think at first, you know, they really didn't mean it, literally. But then some, for some reason, we just, we started talking about it. Like it could actually, you know, happen. And, um, and next thing I knew, you know, we were walking down the street towards my house. What happened next? Paul, you know, came in through my window. We got the guns and we went to the living room and waited. The whole time, you know, we were, you know, second guessing, you know, saying like, can we really do this, you know? And, and then in the midst of one of those moments, you know, we heard him coming. And then it was like, well, it, it's too late. You know, we can't turn back. I remember, you know, shooting once he came, you know, through the, through the doorway. And then Paul shot, and then I shot, and then Paul shot. And that was it. After that happened, what did you think? What went through you? Yeah, I just remember sitting there, and, you know, my ears were ringing. I couldn't hear anything. Um, you know, I could, you could smell, you know, the gunpowder. And I just remember sitting there and just looking. And then I looked at Paul, and he was looking at me. And I got up and looked out the window, and my neighbors, there was like eight people across the street, they were all looking at the house. And then at that point, what went through my mind was, you know, first, uh, you know, are they gonna call the cops? And then second was, well, if they do, well, I can either call an ambulance, you know, right now. I can, you know, run like I had planned, or I can kill myself. Those were my three options that I was, you know, really thinking about. What I think drew me out of that was Paul. He said, I think he said something like, you know, like what, you know, what do we do now? And uh, and then I said, well, we, we gotta we gotta get out of here because I didn't, you know, I didn't have the balls to kill myself. I looked at Phil and I knew that it was, it was he was gone. So there was no point in calling an ambulance. Lundy, Gingrich, and 12-year-old Chase Williams, who was a lookout outside the house, set a time to meet back at Lundy's house. The plan now, to drive to Arizona. We realized that we had told people that we were going to California. So we said, well, you know, we can't go to California now because people are gonna, you know, talk and they'll find out. They didn't make it far. The boys caught at a Walmart in Illinois. I thought my mom, you know, would come pick me up and um, it'd be back to me and her. I really didn't think of, you know, this place. That never, never crossed my mind. In the 15-year-old mind, at what point do you think you realized that prison could be in your future? Never. Just didn't even think it was an option. <laughs> Do you ever go back and wish you could redo that day? Yeah, I do. I, I, I think I would, I wish I could take it back because of all the, you know, the pain and the grief it caused, you know, so many people. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, on the other hand, I wouldn't be who I am today, you know, without without that experience. I own it. You know, it doesn't define me. You know, um, people can remember me for that if they would like. But once they once they know, see who I am now, they're gonna forget all about that. Tomorrow night, more from my interview with Lundy. He shows us his prison routine and job, and he explains why his future looks better because he went to prison. That's when From Kid to Killer continues tomorrow at 6. Alyssa Ivinson, News Channel 15.